What comes to mind when you think of the phrase pride and prejudice? Well, maybe it's that 19th century romantic novel set back in the early 1800s. But that's not what I have in mind. I'm really thinking about an Old Testament story that is wrapped up with those kind of, of characteristics, pride and prejudice. And like so many things that we've discussed out of the Old and the New, we see humanity repeating itself all over again. Being prideful and being prejudiced still exist. The book that I want to discuss for the few moments we have together is the Old Testament book of Jonah. Jonah is mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 14, but there's a short book among those minor prophets in the Old Testament, the way they're designated. It's only four chapters long. But the story of Jonah is very much a story of pride and prejudice. Pride from the standpoint of the way it begins, the statements made in verse 1 and verse 2 of that first chapter, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. No details beyond that are really given in this first chapter. And Nineveh is the capital city of Assyria, and Assyria is becoming a world of power. It's threatening everyone. And if you're a patriot of Israel or even of Judah, the southern kingdom, you really don't like what is taking place hundreds of miles away. The city of Nineveh is about 500 miles to the east of gath Hefer, which is the hometown of Jonah, which is a few miles away from the New Testament city of, of Nazareth. But instead of traveling 500 miles to the east, he gets on a ship designated for a port 2,500 miles to the west. I'm going in the opposite direction. Instead of heading for Syria, I'm heading for Spain. And if I'm that far away, then I don't need to do this. And why would you not? I don't want Assyria becoming a world power. I don't want God actually recognizing them at all. Now God's made the statement that I want you to speak against it because I've seen their wickedness. Well, I want their wickedness to continue. I don't care what God wants, this is what I want. In chapter 1 of Jonah, it's very much a prideful rebellion. But that prideful rebellion shows up in chapter 4 as well. In chapter 1, on that journey, there's a storm that uh, arises and those that are the crew of the ship are doing everything they can to keep the ship afloat. And finally, one goes down into the hold and finds Jonah asleep, wakes him up. You've got to be bailing water like the rest of us. Jonah finally acknowledges that he's the reason for the storm. And then makes a statement that if you throw me overboard, you'll actually have safe passage. They don't really want to believe that. They have a high value of human life. They try to continue lightening the ship, but finally, with no other course of action for their survival, they throw Jonah overboard at his request. The storm subsides. Chapter 2, Jonah finds himself in the belly of a fish that God has prepared to actually swallow him up for three days. Interesting story. And in those three days of darkness, there's a recognition of the problems that he faces. He's brought those problems about on his own. Chapter 1 and chapter 4 are very much a rebellion against God. In Jonah chapter 2 and chapter 3, there is a grudging awareness as well as a grudging obedience. But he doesn't want to do it. By the time you get to chapter 3, chapter 3, when he's back on, on dry land, the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. And again, there are no details that are given. Don't want to do this, but I will. I know what's going to happen, maybe even worse to me this next time if I'm disobedient. So the statement is made in verse number 3 and verse number 4. Jonah rose, went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord, and Nineveh was an exceedingly great city. Verse 4, Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. It takes three days to walk across it, according to verse 3. 
And he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And that's a summation, the message. There's got to be more to it than that, but that's what is recorded. Summary statement, 40 days to continue to exist, and then you're going to be destroyed. The people, in verse, verse 5 and following, the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, put on clothes of grief and mourning, from the greatest to the least. Verse number 6, the word of what Jonah's message involves comes to the ears of the king of Nineveh. And he makes a statement in verse 7 and following, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor cattle, taste anything. Don't let them eat, don't let them drink water, but let us be covered with sackcloth. Cry mightily to God. Let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that's in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? The reaction of the people, the reaction of royalty, recognition that there are problems that need to be faced and we do not want to be destroyed. Verse number 10, Then God saw their works that they had turned from their evil way and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them and he did not do it. So here is an individual named Jonah who is filled with a pride for his home country, a pride for the children of Israel, a pride for the children of Abraham. Doesn't want any power any mighty army coming down and taking away or creating problems. You're taking away the, the, the populace to a foreign land or destroying those cities with which he is familiar. I don't want to do this. Chapter 3, he delivers the message. And then in chapter 4, what happened when the people change the mind, their heart, their actions? It displeased Jonah exceedingly. He became angry. He prayed to God and said, Oh, Lord, was, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore, I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. I didn't want this to happen. I didn't want these people to listen. I wanted these people to be destroyed. The reason for his disobedience, if I'm not around to actually deliver that message, maybe they will be destroyed. Prejudice against the Assyrians, a pridefulness in his nation. Pride and prejudice don't sit well with a command that says to do something different. I want to wallow in my disobedience, and I'll take the consequences until they are so dire that he finally actually, Jonah relents and actually goes and proclaims that message. And his response in verse number, verse number. Three. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Chapter 4 and verse 3. The disposition he has when he does not get his way, it's a temper tantrum from a prophet of God. You often find in cultures of every generation, individuals with that kind of pride about them and with this kind of prejudice, throwing a temper tantrum when they don't get their way. You see it in the government. You may see it down the street. Humanity has never really evolved from the pettiness of centuries gone by. The Lord asked a question in verse 4 to Jonah. Is it right for you to be angry? And ultimately the story ends with a statement because God actually provides shelter for Jonah in the heat of the day. He goes up to the top of an elevated hill to watch and just see if What's going to happen? I really want this, this city to be destroyed. Um, God actually provides a shade and then takes that shade away. And when that shade is not there, verse number 8 of Jonah chapter 4, Jonah wished he had death for himself. It is better for me to die than to live. Verse number 9, Jonah, God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant that was giving you shade? And Jonah says, It is right for me to be angry even to death. Last two verses of this book. The Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, but it perished. Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand or their left? You're concerned about a plant. I'm concerned about humanity. 
people today may be prideful in their concern for things the way they want them to be and forget about a message of God that needs to be shared with the entire world. Do you believe in the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God, forgiveness from God because of that sacrifice of Jesus? How do you respond? I'll be selective in who I talk to about the Word of God. And if they don't meet my standard like Nineveh did not meet Jonah's, then I don't want to have anything to do with them. So with the, the bookends of, of chapter 1 and chapter 4, Jonah being rebellion against God, does the obedience really kind of fit? No, it's obedience because he feels he's coerced into it. I don't want to do this, but I will, nonetheless. Pride and prejudice. Problem in the past can be a problem today. Question for us. How do we react to people around us? Do we have the same kind of bad perceptions of others as did Jonah? Or do we recognize that God's mercy and His Word need to be extended to every human being on the planet? Interesting four chapter book. It's more than just Jonah and the fish, it's pride and prejudice. It really kind of did him, yeah. Please stay safe. We'll talk again soon.